And uh, since it is a, a relatively long book, and uh, we're, we're going to be in Acts for, uh, Lord willing, the, the remainder of most Sundays this year, uh, as we journey through Acts, I want to kind of keep this reminder in front of us, um, that, that we're not kind of detached from this as if it's just some uh, ancient historical text, right? What we are learning about is our own history as the church. If you look on the, the slide here, remember the mission of FBC Afton is the title of our series through this book. Because what we see in Acts is that the mission of the early church still defines our mission today. And so periodically, I plan to try to kind of recap where we have been thus far to help us see how the mission of the early church specifically defines our mission today. And so this morning, our passage ends at a key turning point. Pastor Ryan uh, just read a, a section of our passage, and this is the last time really where the religious council is seen interacting with the church, we could say in a relatively controlled manner. The first interaction in the book of Acts, we see the council in prison and threaten a couple of the apostles. This time, they do the same thing, but they add a beating at the end for good measure. And next time, the book of Acts shows them jumping straight to murder. And so Lord Willen, we'll see how God even unexpectedly uses the hostility, the growing hostility against the church to advance the mission that Jesus gave the church in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Again, the mission that still defines our mission today. And so if you would, I, I want to reintroduce our own mission statement to you uh, this morning. And if you would, uh, join with me and let's read this mission together. Will you? We exist to love God and others, grow as Christ followers, devoted to serving one another, and multiply disciples. And we do this through four sequen sequential pillars or uh, themes or categories that hopefully you're familiar with, connect, grow, serve, and go. And so we see how Acts is helping us to, to wrap our minds around this mission and, and this, this process. We, we saw the mission uh, in Acts 1-8 in our first message in the book of Acts. We did chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and we really observed how this mission of connect, grow, serve, go, it's, it's kind of like a, a cyclical mission. Again, I used the word sequential uh, before. And so first and foremost, when we talk about connecting with God, it's, it's connecting with God through salvation. And so once we connect with God through salvation, we don't stop connecting. We continue to love God, and, and then we continue to do these other things. We, we, we grow in Christ-likeness. We serve one another. We, we go into the world and multiply disciples. Or as Acts 1.8 says it, we are witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so when we talk about going, what we're really doing is we're going, we're witnessing to Christ by inviting people to, to join in on this cyclical, this sequential mission, which again starts all the way back with connecting with God through salvation. And so that was our first week in the book of Acts. Our second week in the book of Acts, we were in chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. And, and in this section, we saw the early church discerning God's leaders together. They sought to, uh, to, to fill the, the office of the 12th apostle that had been left vacant by Judas in his betrayal of Jesus. And they used a process, and as we observe this process, it helps to define our own process for discerning God's leaders together as a church today, or as we call it, our elder evaluation process. <clears throat> Next, we, uh, we're in Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 41, this is uh, known as Pentecost, if you're familiar or you remember. And, and at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is, is poured out upon the church, upon the people of God. It fills them, and they do these incredible things. And then Peter gives this incredible sermon filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And in it, he preaches that, that we must repent and what? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And so this teaches us how still today, connecting with God includes baptism. 
In the early church, it shows us how salvation and baptism are, are intrinsically linked together. When, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you repent, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, it is like, like a, 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 excuse me, a, a truck or a, a tractor pulling a wagon. It is, it is linked to it. It follows right closely behind it. And so salvation and baptism, they go hand in hand. Next, we were in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. We saw an example of a healthy church. And based off their example, we saw some pretty fundamental things of what it means to be the church. First, we talk about this idea of connecting with God and one another. We see them by gathering in these large groups for corporate worship. They were going to the temple. They were worshiping God in large groups together. But then they also gathered in smaller groups in one another's homes. And it said they fellowshiped, they broke bread, they shared meals together, and they prayed. And so then today, we continue with our mission. We, again, we talk about connecting with God and others. In one sense, we gather for corporate worship in large groups like we're doing right now on Sunday mornings. And then we gather in smaller groups throughout the, the weeks. We, we gather in one another's homes to, to do this same thing, to fellowship, to, to break bread, to share meals together, and to pray both for and with one another. And then in Acts chapter 3, Peter, again, does this public teaching, and, and in his teaching, it is uh, formed by the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And, and by teaching on this, this is what grows his listeners in Christ's likeness. And so then likewise, when we talk about our mission today, our, our growing, our teaching then must be defined by the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This is what defines the, the teaching like right now on a Sunday morning. But in all different avenues and, and venues of teaching, it must be defined by the person and work of Jesus Christ to grow us in Christ's likeness. After we studied Acts chapter 3, we saw in chapter 4 verses 1 through 31 how the church started to face persecution. And what do we see the church do in response to this persecution? Well, they gathered together for prayer. They connected with God by gathering for prayer. And the, the result was it actually emboldened their witness. So when we look at our four pillars here, before we can ever even really get to this idea of going and, and trying to be witnesses in our own strength, we must connect with God in prayer. And so we gather as a church on the third Sunday of every month to connect with God in prayer. And if you're looking at your calendar, you'll notice next month, the third Sunday, is Father's Day. And so we don't want to interrupt family events or activities or anything like that. So we're rescheduling next month to the second Sunday. So if you want to mark your calendars right now, the next prayer gathering is scheduled for June 12th. We go from 6 to 7 p.m. We pray through a psalm, just like we saw the early church doing in the book of Acts. And then last week, we learn from these two contrasting stories in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, where we have the generosity of Barnabas against the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And, and we talked about how grasping onto the gospel grows us in generosity. It is a, a, an embodiment, a reflection of Christ's likeness, who is the, the model of generosity. And so this growing in generosity in material ways, in relational ways, in emotional ways, this is uh, the norm for Christians. This is the expectation, the standard that Christians are to be people who are growing in generosity. And we do this by grasping onto the gospel. And so this defines uh, our mission today as well. And so then this morning, we come to Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 42. And we get this idea of being a witness. It entails having a good reputation while also maintaining that witness in the face of suffering or opposition. And so you see our outline on the, the slide here uh, begins with the early church. Uh, they, they ministered to the marginalized in verses 12 through 16. And then what followed in verses 17 through 32 is that they were persecuted by the proud. And then our passage concludes with them being, wi or excuse me, being whipped, yes, for being witnesses in verses 33 through 42. And the, the, the best summary I, I could kind of come up with uh, for, for this whole entire text is, is that for us today, we must witness to the marginalized for this good reputation of love, but we must also witness to the proud 
for this good reputation of boldness and everyone in between. Again, Pastor Ryan read this portion of Acts where the the early church suffered, was, was beaten, and this suffering, it still continues today. And when we see faithfulness in Christians, despite the suffering that they are facing, the opposition that they are facing, the persecution they are facing, on one hand, it's, it's a bit convicting, right? Because you think, oh, I don't know if I'm really that faithful in the face of opposition. But it's also encouraging because it is a demonstration of the presence of the Holy Spirit in God's people. And we have an enemy who is, is, is opposing this every step of the way. Satan, he hates gospel ministry. And so when we are seeking to take part in gospel ministry, opposition will inevitably come. And this is what is happening to the apostles in our passage this morning. As they are ministering in Jesus' name, opposition, persecution are increasing. Threats and violence is intensifying. And it will continue throughout the book of Acts, continue throughout the history of the church, and it continues even into present day. In fact, I found one study that estimates that Christians, more Christians, have been killed for their faith in the last 120 years than the first 1900 years of the church's history combined. And so hostility is really taking root starting here in the book of Acts, and it is growing throughout the history of the church. And even here in, in our context, um, we, can, we can probably notice that there seems to be this uh, increasing level of uh, just, just negativity, if I could summarize it that way, toward Christianity, right? That seems to feel like, hey, if you want to be a Christian, it's, it's your personal relationship, and, and that's okay, it's fine. But if we live as Christ's witnesses in this context, it seems to be increasingly met as, as offensive, right? But the gospel message is not something that is, is to remain private. The gospel itself is not a, a private matter, right? Jesus, he was executed in the middle of this huge crowd that was gathered together for a, a, to celebrate a holiday. And then after he rose from the dead, he showed himself to many witnesses, and then he gave the commission to spread his message publicly. And so that's what these early Christians are doing. And as a result, they are met with hostility. But don't miss that, that while, yes, in most of this passage, they are met with hostility from this, this religious council, we also see that they remain a great blessing to many others, right? And so likewise today, being a witness for Christ, it may anger some, but it will also bless many others. And so let's first look at how the, uh, the early church, how they ministered to the marginalized in verses 12 through 16. Jesus, in his uh, most famous sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, started by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the marginalized kind of summarizes this idea of the poor in spirit. It's people who know they need saving. They need a savior. And so when they hear the gospel, they embrace the good news of Jesus Christ. You can understand the, the poor in spirit of the marginalized as, as those who are uh, humble or, or even destitute to a certain degree. And so they embrace this good news of Jesus. They're, they're drawn to Christ by the witness of the church, by their, their reputation of love. And so these apostles here, they, they had just been arrested in chapter 4. Don't forget the context here. And we, we said, despite the, the hypocrisy of, of Ananias and Sapphira that just happened at the start of chapter 5, we see the work of the Spirit increasingly on display. In verse 12, it says, the apostles, they're not afraid to continue performing signs and wonders among the people. And it says that they were all together. They were sharing life together. They were, they were caring for these people together. And then verse 14 says that more than ever, believers were being added to the church. But on each side of verse, or excuse me, right in between verse 12 and verse 14, it seems that verse 13 at first reading says that, that people were actually unwilling to join the church, as many people have understood this verse to say. But if that's the case, it seems like these two verses are, are contradicting themselves right here. Verse 13 says, no one was willing to join, no one dared join. And then verse 14 says, but more than ever we're joining. So what is, what is, what is being said here in these two verses? Well, 
We have to, we have to do a little bit of a, a grammar study here. Um, the them in verse 13 uh, is not referring to the church in a general sense. Verse 12 shows us that it's talking about the ministry of the apostles. That's the main topic in these verses. So the them refers to the apostles. So verse 13 is saying that actually fellow believers would not dare join the apostles while they were performing signs and wonders. And the, the ministry of the apostles here, it resulted in them having a good reputation. The people held them in high esteem. They, they spoke well of the apostles. So this verse is, is continuing this thread that we've been seeing throughout the early chapters of Acts. And that is an emphasis on the authority, the unique authority of these apostles as God's chosen leaders for this specific time in the history of the church. Again, going back to last week's passage, what we see people were bringing their money to the apostles for the apostles to distribute. Peter was this conduit through which healing happened to the man uh, outside the gate called Beautiful, but also through which God's judgment came to Ananias and Sapphira. And so these ongoing signs and wonders in verse 12 are also emphasizing their authority, and it's, in, it's showing that, that their good reputation is increasing. And according to verse 14, the result was God increasing the number of believers more than ever. And you can imagine our author, Luke, he's been uh, keeping a numerical tally up to this point of the, the number of members in the church. First, we saw there was 120, and then he said 3,000, and then he said about 5,000 men. And now he's like, there's more than ever. There's more than I can count, right? And there's multitudes of both men and women. There's so many believers. And then it's in verses 15 and 16 where we see it's the marginalized who are being ministered to here. These are the humble people, the, the poor in spirit that Jesus uh, really kind of prophesied about to a certain degree in the Sermon on the Mount. These, these people, they were, they were so desperate, and we get an idea of how desperate they are and how highly they regarded the apostles because they were just hoping Peter's shadow alone might cast over them, and, and that would be enough to provide healing for them. And we see numerous accounts in the Bible where God heals people through surprisingly miraculous means. And, and miracle healings, they, they happen outside the bounds of, of natural human order. A miracle is, is, is something that's brought on about, or excuse me, brought on by, by God's will, and, and we can't understand it or explain it by human senses. It, it shows how Jesus' power, it, it transcends human nature. His power, it's, it's greater than our laws of nature. And so when a human performs a miracle in the Bible, it authenticates their authority. And so this means the miraculous healing power, it does not ultimately come from Peter or the rest of the apostles. It is Jesus' power being channeled through them, proving, again, God has given them this authority. And so when something happens outside the common course of nature like this, it, it proves the power and authoritative presence of God. A true miracle only happens by God. And so that's what's happening here with the apostles. And the authority of God and the power of God and the presence of God is being displayed through them. You could almost see it as it's the, the credentials that they are God's chosen leaders for this early church. And so they're speaking with the authority that God has given them. But not only do we see God's power superseding the natural bounds, human laws, but it is more powerful, we see in verse 16, than even evil spirits. Look, people who are afflicted with unclean or evil spirits, they are being healed as well. And so these evil spirits throughout... The scriptures generally refer to these supernatural beings. We can often equate them similarly to demons, and, and they're, they're, just, they're malicious toward, toward humans. Their, their goal is to cause harm and destruction. Throughout the Gospels, we see evil spirits causing self-destruction, isolation, insanity, outbursts, convulsions, gnashing teeth, foaming mouth, and stiffness. And we see here God is, is delivering people from these afflictions through his apostles. 
the people are being given spiritual freedom. There's no evil power that can stand against God, just as there's no natural power that can prevent God. And so today, God still heals people. Now, the, the ministry, the miraculous ministry of the marginalized here, it, it was unique. Um, and in a general sense, uh, we, we kind of have this understanding of, of common grace. And so he, he heals people most, most commonly in our context through means like modern medicine. But it doesn't mean that, that he is completely out of the, the miracle game. He can, if it is his will, still heal through miraculous means. And so as his people, we must pray for healing. But we must understand when we pray for healing that regardless, God is going to answer yes. It may or may not be in this world. Yes, in this world is a possibility. But if not yes in this world, ultimately yes in the world to come. And so that gives us great hope when we pray for healing. But taking a step back and looking at this section in the lesson from the apostles and the marginalized here, I think our temptation too often is to jump straight to the apostles and identify ourselves with the apostles. But instead of first jumping there, we must first identify ourselves with the marginalized. Right? We must first approach Christ as the poor in spirit. This is the only way we come to Jesus because we, like the marginalized here, are afflicted with, if nothing else, the evil spirit of self. And so we are helpless sinners in need of grace. So we cannot approach Jesus as if we can take care of ourselves and he's just gonna jump on as a, a, a backup plan or he's gonna ride shotgun while we're calling the shots. No, we come poor in spirit or we do not come at all. And tragically, there are many who don't come to Jesus because of pride. And that is what we see from the religious council here in Acts. The gospel, what is happening, it's spreading among the marginalized because they're the ones who know, I need help, I need saving, I need a savior. And so we don't see the apostles strategizing some, some, some great uh, tactic to, to convince all the, the movers and shakers of their day to, to, to influence everyone else in the society. No, they embody the compassionate strategy that was modeled by Jesus. They ministered to the marginalized. And so therefore, as we have opportunities to minister to the marginalized in our lives after we first come to Jesus as the marginalized. We, we take those opportunities. And so we minister to the marginalized. We must do this for a reputation of love. And it brings glory to God. So we must be committed to being witnesses this way to the marginalized. And what do we see happen as a result of the apostles' ministry to the marginalized here? Going back to verse 14, they had that good reputation of love. They were spoken well of. And what? More believers than ever were being added. But as numbers increase, so does persecution. We see that, yes, we minister to the marginalized, but we don't shy away from ministering to the proud and powerful as well. In verses 17 through 32, the apostles we see are persecuted by the proud. It's very similar to what happened in chapter 4. The apostles were doing signs and wonders. There's a miraculous healing in chapter 4. And this time, however, um, it's not just Peter and John who are arrested. It's all the apostles who are arrested. So again, we're seeing in small ways here, opposition is increasing. And just like before, we see the high priests, we see the Sadducees. These are members of the council, the Sanhedrin, who are leading this opposition. And what's the motivation for their opposition? Well, in verse 33, we see they're enraged by the apostles' ministry. These proud individuals, they love their power. And so as they're watching these, uh, these ragtag apostles gain popularity and influence, they are, as verse 17 says, envious of them. Instead of being filled with the Spirit, they're filled with what? Jealousy. So at this point, they don't even care about the message. They don't even care about what's really true. They're just jealous because these apostles are building a following that's supposed to follow them. 
They think they've already taken care of this Jesus problem. And now there's these pesky apostles who keep performing miracles and are preaching Jesus. And so we again see in verse 18 that they arrest the apostles. And we must again understand this council. They are wonderfully tactful at the game of politics. They had managed to cozy up to the Romans who were in power at this time and, and work out a mutually beneficial agreement to maintain their little, little mountain of power. But now what's happening is, is they're jealous because they're outraged that, that the, the, the apostles, they would have the audacity to heal people when that's supposed to be their power to, do, to offer that. They're infuriated that these apostles would dare love people without their permission to do so. And they can't hide their anger any longer toward this gospel message. They just want it to go away. And they're not doing this ultimately out of a, a place or a motivation where they just want people to be sick and they want people to be afflicted by evil spirits. No, sin is much more clever and deceptive than that. Ultimately, they're willing to allow that to be a byproduct as long as they get to keep being the ones in power. But the apostles here, they're making it clear how truly powerless this council is. And similar things happen in our modern world today, right? As, as Christians, um, we, can, we can minister and, and do help mercy type ministries uh, to, to the marginalized, to those in need. And we do it in the name of Jesus. And, and, and people who, who don't believe in Jesus will actually be angry toward the Christians, not because they hate the good or the helpful ministering or the mercy that's being showed, but ultimately because they hate the message. And so we must be prepared because opposition will follow ministry as long as that ministry includes the message, as long as we're being faithful to be witnesses to Jesus. And then in verse 19, we saw how uh, an angel miraculously frees the apostles from prison in response to uh, the council arresting them and imprisoning them. But look at what verse 20 shows us here. The angel didn't free the apostles just so they could be free, right? There was a purpose behind this prison break. This mediator was sent by God to deliver a specific message to these apostles. So after opening the doors to the prison, the angel commands them to go, right? And to do what? Stand in the temple and speak all the words of this life. In other words, preach the gospel. Can you think of anything ironic about this angel giving them this command at this moment in the context of what's been going on for the apostles. That's exactly what got them put in prison in the first place, right? And so what do the apostles do in verse 21? They're like, yeah, right, deuces, we're free, we're out. We're gonna run for our lives, we're gonna hide for cover. We're, we're, we're free now, so we're just gonna go on and we're gonna enjoy our newfound freedom. No, they immediately obey the command from the angel. They go and they preach the gospel. And so God's purpose in freeing his people from physical shackles is to free others from spiritual shackles, not ultimately for us to enjoy this human concept of freedom in this world. And this account, it's a comforting reminder for us because as God's people, we are not expected to be his witnesses on our own. And no, he's not going to always send an angel to us, but, but he's already promised and assured us of something even greater. He gives us himself, the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God in us. And so verse 21 continues to describe how the morning after, the apostles are right back where? In the temple where they just got arrested. And they're right back doing what? Teaching Jesus, which is what they just got arrested for. And so because they were set free from prison by apparently a, a super stealthy angel. Verse 21 shows how the council then the next morning is clueless that these apostles are in the temple teaching the people. So instead what they're doing, they're just kind of gathering together off by themselves and they're getting ready to take some sort of decisive action against the apostles. 
And remember, this is the same council that condemned Jesus to death on the cross. They were the highest authority for the Jews in all matters of religion, justice, and civility. And so they're convening, preparing to, to use that authority against the apostles to so say, bring the apostles before us. And then verses 22 and 23 say the officers go to their cell and they come back and they say, hey, we got some good news. That prison, it is, it is locked down. It is secure. Check. The guards, they are at their post. They're vigilant. They're right where they're supposed to be. Check. Little issue. The apostles are nowhere to be found. And so then in verse 24, you see that the, the captain of the temple, the chief priest, they're baffled. They're like, how are they in place? How are the doors locked? And how are the apostles free? But before they even have a chance to respond to this, they're still left baffled. And they're probably baffled even more when they find out in verse 25 that the apostles did not flee, but in fact are right there back in the temple. And guess what they're doing? They are teaching about Jesus. And so you have to imagine in this moment that this council has to at least a little bit realize how repeatedly they are being confronted with these inexplicable events. I mean, they saw that, that man who was crippled, crippled when they would come into the temple and somehow he's been healed. Can't explain it. And now in this moment, these apostles, everything's locked up. Guards are still on their posts and yet they've escaped from prison, can't explain it. The evidence of the Spirit's presence in this community is overwhelming, and yet the council remains unmoved. And so this is a reminder that there is no amount of, of, of convincing or, or clever, crafty arguments or, 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 or proving in this world alone that can produce faith. Really, seeing is not believing, because they saw many evidences of the Spirit's presence, and yet they remain unmoved. The council overwhelmingly rejects the even more overwhelmingly convincing evidence. Why? Because their heart is too proud. Their heart is too hard. They are not willing to humble themselves. They would rather try to do everything they can to keep their power than trust in what is true, no matter how overwhelming the evidence is against them. And so because that's where their heart is aligned at this moment, you can imagine the force they would like to use against the apostles here. But verse 26 says, at least out before the people, they're too scared because they don't want to get stoned by the people. All the people are responding positively to the teachings about Jesus. These people have found favor among the people. And so the captain of the, the officers in, in the council, they know better than to try to anger this, this large public right now. And you can imagine how, because of this, the, the council is seeing their power rapidly slipping away like water trying to hold in the palms of their hands. And so again, we see in verse 28, they respond by once again trying to maintain a greater concern for their power over what evidence shows is true. And so in their uh, charge here to the apostles in verse 28, they're actually referring back to an earlier charge from Acts chapter 4, verse 18. And they're saying, we charged you then, and now you're violating the charge that we charged you with. So we're charging you for that as well. But it's ironic because they apparently didn't even listen to what the apostles said back in that initial charge because Acts 4.20 Peter and John say, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard about Jesus. And somehow this council is shocked that Peter, John, and the other apostles are, as it says, filling Jerusalem with their teaching about Jesus. So the overarching charge, once again, is blasphemy. But notice they're not just concerned about that charge here. Now, at the very end, they add an and to that, right? And what? They are equally concerned that these apostles who have a good reputation are now making them look bad. They're saying, hey, you keep blaming us for, for Jesus' death, and, and, and the people are, are now in favor of Jesus, and so you're making us look bad before the people. And they're right to be concerned about this. 
But they're not the only ones who are held responsible throughout Acts. Repeatedly, we see Peter has been holding all audiences, all listeners responsible for Jesus' death. In Acts 2.23, he said this to the crowd at Pentecost. In Acts 3.15, he said this to the the crowd that gathered at Solomon's portico with the, the man who had just been healed. And he also said it once before to the council in Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Peter is determined to make everyone he can aware that that we are responsible for the death of Jesus. He holds all listeners responsible. And the difference is that many of the other people who have heard this message have been responding in faith. They are repenting for their sins. And so the teaching of Jesus is spreading like wildfire among the marginalized in Jerusalem, but not the case for this proud council. They do not respond in faith. They do not respond in humility. They do not respond in repentance. They respond in irritation, right? Again, they're not caring about the truthfulness or the evidence. They want to stop it through any means necessary. But unfortunately for them, they're working against the Holy Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit empower the apostles to respond in a mighty way in verses 29 through 32. And before we look at their response, it's important to note, again, the context around their response. Because too often people take this as a justification to just push back against things they don't like. And so we must remember, in the overarching teaching of the the Bible, of the Scriptures, is that God sets authorities in their place. And in a general sense, we see, especially throughout the New Testament, Christians are called to be good citizens. I mean, this same Peter who says these words to this council here would later write in 1 Peter that Christians are to honor the emperor. And so the Bible repeatedly teaches that Christians recognize authorities as being established by God, and we do that by respecting and submitting to them. The only exception is in a case like this, when an authority directly contradicts God's word. But ultimately, Christians are submitting to these human authorities as a a manifestation of the way we submit to Jesus. And so in simple ways, Christians should be people who wear seatbelts and pay taxes, who who adhere to building codes and zoning codes, and and, and, and who who renew their fishing licenses and hunting licenses and, and all the other laws of the lands, right? But we see there are times, like here in Acts, when Christians cannot obey an authority. And again, this is not just rebelling against something you don't like or someone you don't like. This is not refusing to do something because it makes you uncomfortable or you don't want to do it. It's not disobeying an authority because, well, I didn't vote for them, so I don't have to follow them. No, the council here is directly trying to forbid what God commands. And therefore... Even though there will be consequences for going against an authority, it is worth it. And so like the apostles, Christians must respond in instances like this, that we must obey God rather than people. And yes, the counsel here is being unjust, but the mission of the apostles is not to end this injustice against them. Right? Their mission is to continue to teach in the name of Jesus, to continue to be a witness to Jesus, and, and, and so as uh, other people will respond in faith and repentance to that message. So this is not ultimately an issue about free speech and winning their, their opportunity to have free speech. No, they're going to speak in Jesus' name with or without the freedom to do so because their mission is to see people changed by Jesus by being a witness of Christ. And so they cannot stop preaching the gospel. And notice, they, they, they still don't even respond to this, this council with hatred or violence. They just maintain a steadfastness of declaring the good news of Jesus Christ. And so they take advantage of every gospel opportunity. We've seen that they witness to the marginalized, and they also witness to the proud and the powerful. They saw this confrontation with the council as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And so they said here almost the exact same thing the last time they stood before the council. 
And notice their emphasis in verse 30. They refer to God as what? The God of our fathers. They're, they're identifying still with this council. They're saying, hey, we're talking about Yahweh. We're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking about the, the God that, that we all claim to serve. We're saying our God, your God that you worship, he is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. The same Jesus that you murdered by hanging on a tree. And even though they are continuing to apply pressure on the council, this is really an opportunity of grace because they are still saying, and you can repent. But their response to the apostles, or excuse me, the response to the council is, is putting them in physical danger, but they're not gonna stop. They continue in verse 31, emphasizing the exaltation of Jesus to the right hand of God. And so they've used the name of the God that this council claims to worship, and they're using the scriptures that this council claims to obey. This is taken directly from the Psalms. They're saying Jesus is the rightful heir to David's throne. Jesus is God. And this council has a track record of not responding kindly to this. It said that they desired or sought to kill Jesus in John 5.18 and John 10.33 when Jesus made this claim about himself. But they're still not stopping. They're saying to the right hand as what? As leader and savior. This leader, this is a pretty unique title ascribed to Jesus. Not used except for in Acts 3.15 when Peter used it to describe Jesus, the author of life. It's again, it's expressing the authority of Jesus. And he's pairing this authority with his work as savior. So he's saying, Jesus is the source and the leader of salvation, meaning he is it. He's the only savior. And so because Jesus came, look what happened. What did he do? He came to give repentance and forgiveness. And this is even what the prophets promised, a time of repentance and forgiveness where God establishes a new covenant with his people. And the apostles are saying, this is true even to you, to the council, to the religious people who hung Jesus on the tree. And they're saying, we know this is true because as I say in verse 32, we witnessed these things. We saw Jesus. And we also say the Holy Spirit who is in us, who God has given to us, has witnessed these things. And I don't want you to get too hung up on the, the closing remark here. God has given to those who obey him. Some have used this as an argument for, for a works-based salvation, that we earn the Holy Spirit as a reward. That's not what God is saying here. The obedience he is talking about is obedience to trusting in Jesus, faith, and repentance. And these are gifts from God after hearing the gospel. We see all throughout the Bible that this is not what God teaches. The Spirit is not given as a reward for good works. This is the relationship between faith and obedience. That it's, on one hand, it's impossible to be obedient apart from faith. And on the other hand, true faith is then evidenced by ongoing obedience. And so the emphasis here is ultimately trusting the message about Jesus and receiving the Spirit and forgiveness. But what we're seeing in this response from the apostles is a continued theme that they are just consumed with Jesus. They take every opportunity to make Christ known. So we saw early on in this section or in this passage uh, this morning that, that, that they have a reputation of love by witnessing to the marginalized, but they also have this reputation of boldness by witnessing to the proud and powerful. And so this, this means for us today, regardless of who your audience might be, don't waste your opportunities. If you have someone's ear, even if you have their ear in the face of persecution, give the gospel. That's what the apostles are doing. And so they're not ultimately trying to, to help meet these physical needs as their highest uh, concern, nor are they out looking for a fight. They are doing both of these things as witnesses to Christ. And so then in verses 33 through 42, we see the apostles are then whipped for being witnesses by this enraged council, even though the council receives wisdom from one of their leaders. Again, this council, they willingly killed Jesus. You can imagine they would be just as willing to kill his followers here. 
They keep prolonging that Jesus problem they thought they've already taken care of. And so we see in verse 33, they're enraged. They are ready to kill the apostles. This has escalated quickly from questioning the apostles to warning the apostles to arresting the apostles to now having a rage-filled desire to murder the apostles. And they likely would have done so if it weren't for this respected Pharisee speaking up in verse 34. And don't miss God's sovereignty in this. Gamaliel is but a vessel here. It was God's will for him to step up and speak up, right? And so this teacher, this Pharisee, he was a famous rabbi in his time. Paul said that he studied at the feet of this man in Acts 22.3 as evidence of how privileged he was to, to learn at the hands of this uh, well-revered uh, teacher. And so it's clear when this man speaks, the council listens. And so by God's sovereignty, he became the only thing in this moment that stopped the council from killing the apostles in a rage. And so he has a cool head here and then he lays out a pragmatic argument for dealing with the apostles. First thing he says, hey, be careful about what you're gonna do with these men. And then he begins in verse 36, mentioning a couple other troublemakers from recent memory. And historical records even back this up. There have uh, been records of these revolts against Roman rule, one man named Theudas. He made this claim about himself, perhaps even that he was a savior, and it resulted in hundreds, here it says 400 men who followed him. And, and so Gamaliel says, hey, remember him? Remember that guy? Yeah, what happened to him? Nothing, right? He died, group dissolved, no problem. Then after this guy, he says in verse 37, came another man, Judas, uh, a Galilean. Again, historical records indicate there was an unnamed Galilean who rebelled against this census that Rome had put out in AD 6. This revolutionary, whoever he may have been, was trying to teach the Jewish people not to give to pagan rulers as the census called to, like the Romans. And however, like others before him, his revolt failed. And many believe this unnamed Galilean outside of the Bible is in fact Judas the Galilean, mentioned here in verse 37. But regardless, Gamaliel is saying what these apostles, what this he is insinuating cult is doing is nothing new. He says, so just wait it out and we'll see what happens. But in verse 39, he doesn't rule out the possibility that they may be following God's will. And again, he's not laying this argument out of sympathy for the apostles. It's, it's, it's mere pragmatism, mere logic toward the situation. So his advice is to just leave them alone, avoid them. Why? Again, because if their plan is of human origin, it's gonna fail. But if this is, in fact, God's will, then if we try to stop them, we're not actually fighting against them. We are fighting against God, and we aren't going to win that fight. And so ultimately, he says, hey, let's just step back. Let's surrender control. Let's see what God is going to do with this group who follow this Jesus of Nazarene. And we don't know for certain, but you, you almost get this, this sense that, that Gamaliel kind of picked up on maybe, perhaps, there is something different about this group, right? I mean, he would be aware of all the signs and wonders. He's heard Peter preach the gospel to him on at least two different occasions. He's got to be thinking, man, this, this following is, has gotten even bigger and, and more out of hand than any of these other historical accounts he compared it to. And so it seems, at the very least, it's given him enough pause to say, maybe this is God working. But regardless, he knows, hey, if it's not God, then, hey, give it time, it will fail. And so he says, this is enough reason for him to be patient. But just in case, just to be safe, just to be a little cautious, he does not want to end up on the wrong side of God. And so again, even though this is a pragmatic way to think about it, he does come to a wise and well thought out conclusion. And it says the council decides to take his advice, but they couldn't just accept the advice and let the, the apostles go on their merry way. No, in verse 40, uh, they still had all this pent up rage toward them. So they, they release it by beating the apostles. This is likely one of the uh, traditional 40 lashes, uh, less one. And so after they, they whip or beat the apostles, they then finally send them off once again, charging them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. You almost get this picture. Hey, we tried arresting you. 
that wasn't enough. Let's try beating you so you know we're serious. And if it happens again, you don't want to know what's going to happen. And again, looking back on the history of the church, Christians have faced similar hostility. Evil leaders capture, kidnap, beat, and torture Christians. But none of them throughout history have been able to stop the mission of Jesus. And Acts shows us how persecution, it does not need to lead to hiding or fear or intimidation, but rather it can lead to joy and faithful steadfastness. And so you can rejoice when, like the apostles, you are counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And like the apostles, you can just keep preaching the gospel. Suffering for Jesus means God is on your side. And in fact, elsewhere the Bible teaches, he perfects you through that suffering. So there's no amount of persecution that can stop God's spirit-empowered people who trust in Jesus as your Savior and remain focused on the gospel. In fact, it says it will bring an inexplicable sense of joy. And think about some of the testimonies uh, that, that have been recorded from missionaries who report about uh, the blessing of being able to love people, marginalized people who are in hostile and impoverished countries. Or, or think about uh, the, the, the downcast Christian who, um, who, who is just feeling dejected, rejected, opposed, uh, ostracized from their family or society. And then they, they talk about the gospel, whether it's someone from church or someone who doesn't know Jesus, and, and they're rejuvenated with this sense of, of peace and assurance and joy. And so the apostles are teaching us that the joy of loving Christ is, 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 is better than the joy from, from comfort in this world or, or safety in this world. And so more than your own life, even in the face of suffering, loving Christ will produce more joy. And so just imagine how comforting a passage like this would be if you were a Christian suffering right now in a, in a place like North Korea or, or somewhere in the, the Middle East, Iraq, or, or Syria, or, or even what's going on in Ukraine right now. There are so many places that are violently hostile toward the gospel. And a passage like this provides great encouragement. But a passage like this should encourage you here as well. When you find yourself being mocked or shunned, ostracized, intimidated, shamed, any sort of suffering that you might find yourself for Christ, you are told you can rejoice because you are in good company. So let's conclude with uh, just a, a couple points of application. And at this time, I'll invite the music team up, um, and then I'll close with a word of prayer, and then we'll close with song. So first, simply, we see early on in this passage that we are to witness to the marginalized for a good reputation of love. But also we see in the latter portion of this passage that we are to likewise witness to the proud and the powerful for a good reputation of boldness. And then all in between as well. And whether a, a person responds in faith and repentance or whether they respond in opposition and persecution, we see that you will be filled with joy. Meaning you'll never regret being a witness for Jesus. We can minister with joy. We can take a beating with joy because ultimately Jesus has done both for us. He has ministered to us and he is taking a beating for us to the point of death. And so let's uh, go before our wonderful Savior in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for coming into this world and ministering to us who are uh, marginalized, who are um, afflicted by uh, the, the sins of our hearts, the, uh, the, the selfishness of our desires, um, and rescuing us from, from that fate that we uh, were so uh, willing and, and persistent to, to head toward. And so, God, we take great joy in having your spirit in us. And, God, we pray that you will help us to embody this as well, that we will uh, seek to minister to the marginalized, in the world, uh, in our world uh, where you have us, Lord. And, and God, we pray um, that, that like Christ took the beating for us on the cross and ultimately died in our place, that we would be willing to uh, continue to be witnesses to even the proud and powerful, uh, 
uh, and be willing to uh, drink up suffering just as you drank up uh, God's wrath uh, on the cross for us, Lord. And, and that through this, we would find great joy and contentment and peace and assurance and your spirit's presence in us and in the continued growth and multiplication of your church as we seek to witness for your namesake, for your kingdom, and for your glory. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for your love toward us. We pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship.